Hi, welcome again to this course on the Gospel of John for St. Luke's U. I am John Gross, and I'm going to be talking about the Gospel of John. Today's lesson is called The Crisis of the Encounter. As I discussed last week, this lecture is about individual encounters with Jesus. We're going to consider John chapters 3 and 4 back to back. In them, we see two individuals have their encounters with Jesus, two individuals who are different in almost every meaningful way, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus' encounters with these individuals are points of crisis in two overlapping ways. First, they are points of crisis in the sense carried by the English word. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines crisis as the turning point, for better or worse, uh, in a medical situation. And it also defines a crisis as the decisive moment, like the turning point in a literary plot. Or an unstable or crucial time in a state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending. And so these encounters that Jesus has with Nicodemus and with the Samaritan woman, they are crises in this sense. They represent turning points. They represent decisive moments. They also represent crisis in a sense carried by the Greek word from which the English word crisis is derived. And that word is krisis. This word can be defined as a legal process of judgment or judging. That is the supplying of a verdict. In the Gospel of John, the encounters between an individual and Jesus are crises in both of these senses. It is a crisis in that it is a turning point. The encounter with Jesus is the decisive transformational moment where people either embrace Jesus or it's the moment where all things that could get in the way of wholeheartedly embracing Jesus suddenly come to light. And that acceptance or rejection leads to a verdict because a person's true feelings about the God whom Jesus reveals have just been uncovered. So that's why I'm going to refer to the encounter between Jesus and people as a crisis. It is a moment where all of the most important things suddenly and decisively come to the surface. We see this happen in Jesus' encounters with Nicodemus and with a Samaritan woman. And I hope that it will be a way for us to see what needs to happen in Jesus' encounters with us. There's another way that we can describe this kind of crisis encounter with Jesus. And this is one that I'm going to keep referring to throughout this lecture. And I hope it's maybe a little bit more comforting than this notion of crisis or judgment. And that is that when Jesus encounters these individuals in the fourth gospel, Jesus encounters them right at the heart of their personal arena. Now, when I say arena, I mean it in the sense that is discussed in the work of Brene Brown. As many of you may know, Brene Brown is an academic researcher whose training is in social work. She's done a lot of research on shame and vulnerability, and sharing the results of that research has earned her a huge following of non-academic readers. Many people know her through the TED Talk called The Power of Vulnerability, which is among the top five most viewed TED Talks. In her popular writing and speaking, Brene Brown spends a lot of time developing out the concept of the arena. As she uses the term, the arena is the place of vulnerability, the place where control is not guaranteed, but it is also the place of growth because whether we succeed or we fail in those places, we learn more about something that really matters to us. And it's going to be something where we're growing, where we haven't really already mastered what's going on. The arena can look like a lot of different things depending on the individual in question. The arena could be the moment of waiting for results in a big election. It can be telling your crush how you really feel about them for the first time. It can be a new fledgling band performing at their first open mic night. It could be a poet letting other people read their work for the first or maybe even the hundredth time. In a lot of ways, I was just in arena for a while trying to figure out what I was going to do for a job. I'm very fortunate to have landed a pastoral residency position that is soon going to be taking my family to Denver, Colorado, which is a place that we've always wanted to return to. But it was an arena because I didn't have control over the outcomes and the stakes were high enough to matter. Every time I would do any step 
related to this job search, it threw me into the arena because I didn't have control over the outcomes. I could edit my resume, I could try to tweak the way I present my credentials, I could try to prepare for the kinds of questions that I would be asked in the job interview, and I would hope that people would respond to me well, or just that people would reply at all to the application materials I sent out. But it was a place that really mattered, and it was a place where I was growing, and it was a place where I didn't really have control. And I think the arena for a lot of us can look like a lot of different things. And regardless of where you are in the arena, the arena is a really difficult place. And it's a place where we need feedback from other people. But if you are familiar with Brene Brown's discussion of the arena, you are probably familiar with the kinds of people who Brene recommends we have give us feedback about what happens in our arena. Because for her, she wants us to recognize that the arena is a place where we can be profoundly vulnerable, we can be subject to people's criticism, but not all or really most criticism is what matters. And to illustrate that, she often leans on this quotation from Teddy Roosevelt. The quotation goes something like this. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually does strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the greatest devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And I like to lean on this concept of the meeting in the arena to talk about these crisis encounters that Jesus has with individuals. I think one really interesting way to try to wrap your head around what the incarnation of Jesus is, is that it's actually God meeting us in our arena, whatever that arena may looks like, might look like. God is actually descending to meet us in the places where our faces are marred by dust and sweat and blood, where Jesus comes to us face to face, next to us and with us in those situations. I think that the arena concept is a really good way to make sense of the crisis encounter that takes place between Jesus and individuals in the Gospel of John. Because of the familiarity with victory or defeat that the arena provides, that daring greatly that proceeds triumph or defeat, that is a crisis. It is a decisive turning point. The arena where we dare greatly can be so hard because we feel like how we perform in the arena yields a judgment, that's the Greek sense of crisis, a judgment or a verdict. So I think this arena concept, this idea that Jesus meets people where life is difficult and Jesus comes face to face and next to, not looking on the outside, but descends into the situations of people in the arena. I think this can be a really good lens for looking at the encounter between Jesus and individuals. And I think that can be a really good lens for understanding Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. And I think it's really helpful because it will give us a chance to do two things. One thing that this arena lens will help us do is keep us from flattening each character. One sort of standard way to look at the stories of Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John is to contrast the two, using them as examples, respectively, of negative and positive responses to Jesus. Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night, so he's often interpreted as a sort of shady character who can't understand Jesus at all, despite having all of his Jewish credentials together. So he becomes this flatly negative example of unbelief. And the Samaritan woman, by contrast, comes to Jesus at high noon. She understands Jesus' message and even becomes the first person really to evangelize in the Gospel of John. And so she kind of becomes a poster child of belief and discipleship. But I think this 
usage of Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman as negative and positive responses to Jesus, there is textual evidence for these approaches, but if that's the whole view that we take, we're going to miss some things. Both Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, I think, are more complicated and more multidimensional than that negative, positive, interpretive lens might allow us to see. I think that Jesus is meeting these individuals in their arenas because the arena is a complicated place. And interpreting these stories as moments where Jesus is meeting them in their respective arenas, that is going to give us a way of reading that keeps us from flattening these people. And it leads to another benefit of interpreting in this way, which is that the arena is a place we all can identify with. By reading these encounters between Jesus and individuals as meetings in the arena, we'll have a tool for how Jesus meets us. We'll have a tool for understanding how Jesus meets us. Because one truth about Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman is that they are imperfect people who understand Jesus imperfectly. And the reality is that's how all of us approach Jesus. So with that, we can get into encounters with the individuals. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Nicodemus, and then I'm going to be talking about the Samaritan woman. When we first take a look at Nicodemus, we have... A number of reasons to believe that he's a little bit suspicious. So I'm going to go through, you see them on the PowerPoint slide here, some of the reasons why a lot of interpreters, their first instinct looking at Nicodemus is to sort of portray him as someone who encounters Jesus and just doesn't get it. And the first is that Nicodemus is an example of Nick at night. Get it? Because he's Nicodemus and it's at night and also... Nick at night is like, okay, whatever. Um, so Nicodemus shows up at night and because the Gospel of John likes to use a lot of light versus dark language and talks about Jesus as the light of the world, the fact that Nicodemus enters kind of secretly, that looks a little bit suspicious, especially because the Gospel of John elsewhere, I think at the end of chapter 12, talks somewhat negatively about people who believe in Jesus but are a little secretive about it because they're afraid of being found out. So. Nicodemus showing up at night, that might cast a little suspicion on him. And then he's impressed. He says in verse in, in verse 3, 2, uh, Rabbi, he, this is what Nicodemus says to Jesus. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And in two twenty three through 25, just a few verses before that, it says this. While Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs that Jesus was performing. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them because Jesus knew all people. He did not need any testimony about humanity because he knew it was in each person. And so we have this sort of implication that when people show up to have an encounter with Jesus, they're just showing up because they've been razzle-dazzled by the signs that Jesus did, like the one that happened at the beginning of John chapter 2, where Jesus turns water into wine. And so the fact that Jesus comes onto the scene saying, wow, you must be from God because you're performing all these signs, that might mean that Nicodemus is invested for the wrong reasons. And then we have in verse 4, after Nicodemus sort of begins this conversation with Jesus, Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And Nicodemus seems not to understand what Jesus is talking about. Nicodemus says, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And so we have this moment where Nicodemus really isn't understanding that Jesus is speaking metaphorically. And so some interpreters will say something like this, the insiders, the people who really get Jesus, who are reading the Gospel of John, they know that born again is this metaphorical language. But Nicodemus doesn't understand it. There's also this interesting double entendre going on in John chapter 3. The word again can mean both again as in a second time, but it can also mean from above. And we have this moment where these people reading the gospel of John in Greek, they might understand Jesus is talking about you need to be born from above, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is only understanding on one of those levels. So we have that. And then we also have, as the passage goes on, Jesus starts saying more and more. Nicodemus says less and less. And Jesus just sort of takes over the conversation. 
And you can see on the PowerPoint slide that I've gotten on your screen right now, the Samaritan woman contrasts all these things. She shows up at daytime. She believes Jesus is a face value. She gets the metaphor. She holds her own a conversation. Kind of subjective, but Jesus doesn't get as cryptic or ethereal as he gets in John chapter 3 when he's talking to the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. And then after that, sort of the cherry on top is that the Samaritan woman evangelizes in her own way about Jesus. And Nicodemus just sort of fizzles out of the conversation. And so it can be really easy for us to say, yeah, this is kind of, Nicodemus is kind of a negative character. He's an example of someone who doesn't believe it, especially because we have in 3.12, Jesus says to Nicodemus, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And that sounds that kind of sounds like a smoking gun, mic drop moment of, yeah, Nicodemus clearly is not gay. But I think there's more to this character than what we'll pick up if we're looking at these ways in which Nicodemus is a little suspicious or he doesn't quite get it. And, you know, it is really easy in New Testament interpretation to be too hard on a lot of Jewish figures. And it kind of makes sense that we lean into that problem a little bit because there are instances of very clear hostility between Jesus and Jewish leadership. Uh, The Gospel of Matthew plays that up pretty strongly and really so does the Gospel of John. You know, we have in letters like Galatians where Paul has to clarify the message of Jesus in contrast to people arguing for Jewish customs and practices being obligatory for all of Jesus' followers. And so Nicodemus, he really struggles with Jesus's message enough for us to be like, okay, well, he's one of the Jewish leaders. He's one of the Pharisees. They're not fair, you see. And just sort of be like, okay, so Nicodemus is the one who doesn't get it and just kind of move on. But I think what's going on is a little bit more interesting than that. I want us to consider the possibility that Nicodemus isn't someone who just doesn't get it, but rather Nicodemus is a person who approaches Jesus with a certain amount of curiosity, and Jesus meets that curiosity right in Nicodemus's arena. That um, Nicodemus really is trying to understand who Jesus is, and Jesus is meeting that by showing Nicodemus just how far the rabbit hole goes and just how much more there is for him to understand and the immense challenge of understanding and believing in what Jesus has to offer. And perhaps what Jesus is doing is meeting Nicodemus where he is as someone who really does understand the law, understand God, understand Jewish tradition. Jesus is meeting this person and showing this is how challenging it can be. So here's some ways we can read Nicodemus as a little bit more complicated. One of them is in verse 3-4, where Nicodemus is saying, How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. What if Nicodemus just understands the metaphor and is trying to roll along with it. Like, uh, you know, if someone says Jesus is the bread of life and you say, okay, so how does someone eat that bread? Um, That's a perfectly valid question. It doesn't mean you're sort of rejecting the metaphor or failing to understand that the language is metaphorical. And in fact, the Samaritan woman in the next chapter, um, Jesus talks to her about living water and she says, okay, so how do I get this water? She stays within the language of the metaphor, but we don't necessarily tend to think that she's failing to get it. And so in verse 9, Nicodemus says, how can this be? It's possible to read that with a layer of incredulity, but it could be that he's showing up with a little bit of curiosity and maybe a little bit of skepticism. And it's just really hard to understand what Jesus is offering. And I think we have evidence from the Gospel of John that Jesus is playing the long game with Nicodemus. Nicodemus isn't a person who is just failing to believe. He's a person who's being given the opportunity to encounter Jesus and just having a difficult time with the message because Jesus is just meeting Nicodemus in the arena. 
Jesus is telling Nicodemus some really, really hard things. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you are Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you do not accept our testimony. We have this hint later on in John's gospel that Nicodemus is kind of sympathizing with what Jesus is doing in a way that his fellow Pharisees are not necessarily on board with. So at the end of John 7, what's going on is the temple police are being chided by the Pharisees for failing to bring in Jesus, for failing to arrest him. Because at this point in the story, the Pharisees are feeling a little bit threatened by Jesus. And so Nicodemus, and it specifies, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, who was one of their own number, asked, does our own law condemn a man without first hearing him? to find out what he has been doing. And Nicodemus isn't really giving a roiling confession of belief over here, but we're seeing that something's going on with Nicodemus. He didn't just leave this encounter sad and then decide, I guess Jesus isn't for me, but something's still percolating a little bit. And then we find out this really fascinating hint later on in John's gospel that, you know, maybe Nicodemus is a full-on secret believer in Jesus. So this is John chapter 19 after Jesus has died. The author tells us that Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. And Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. And we get this hint, maybe Nicodemus is in the same category. So with Pilate's permission, Joseph of Arimathea comes, takes the body away, but he is accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. So John gives us this really great sort of parenthetical note. Yeah, it's the same guy as chapter three. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus's body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and the strips of linen in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And so we have this moment where it's looking like, oh, actually, maybe Nicodemus is a disciple of Jesus. And whatever it was that happened in this encounter, maybe what was going on was Jesus was simply meeting Nicodemus where he needed to be met. And that was a complicated place. So maybe what's going on is Nicodemus approached Jesus secretly, which that's not ideal, but he approached Jesus secretly because he was curious. And Jesus meets that curiosity by showing Nicodemus the growth point. It's very clear that Nicodemus does not understand. And so that's a reason for us to potentially read him as one of the examples of Jesus' own who did not understand and receive Jesus that we, uh, we hear about in the prologue to the Gospel of John. But maybe Jesus tells Nicodemus the hard things that he has yet to understand or just the things that are most troubling for a religious official to hear. For me, I see that in chapter 3, around verse 8. When Nicodemus asks how someone can be born again, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. And then we have this fascinating piece in verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everything born of the Spirit. And there's this really phenomenal wordplay going on in 3.8. In the Greek, it reads, to pneuma pne. So pneuma is the word for spirit or wind. And pne, uh, that's the verb for blowing. And so pneuma pne, just the wind blows, but it might be, you know, the wind winds, the spirit uh, respires. You kind of have this wordplay where the spirit just is the spirit um, and it moves about as it pleases. And I think this moment of of telling Nicodemus, the spirit is going to do what the spirit's going to do. As a person myself who is, you know, somewhat religiously credentialed, I mean, I'm finishing a PhD in New Testament studies, uh, as someone who is, you know, working on these kind of religious credentials, John 3.8 is actually kind of terrifying 
because it's this uncanny release from control, from logic, from comprehensibility. And so I wonder what if we could approach Nicodemus as someone a little bit like the way we approach uh, the doubting Thomas. We have conceptual space to interpret Thomas as a sort of multifaceted, ambiguous, complicated, imperfect, but nonetheless genuine and believing disciple. We have space to acknowledge how Thomas's faith falters when he needs to see Jesus's wounds to really believe. But we also have space to acknowledge how that doesn't disqualify him from being a genuine disciple. You know, I find myself identifying with Nicodemus a lot because I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, being someone with an MDiv and a THM and working on a PhD, I feel like a 21st century, maybe a younger 21st century version of who Nicodemus was. Um, and I see in this story the way Jesus needs to meet to meet me because, see, I want to know the mechanism. I want to be able to push the buttons that will yield all the results of being born again. If there's a way of rebirth that's, you know, some metaphorical version of just like, I don't know, re-entering some kind of womb, like, okay, let me find the womb. Give me the key. I'll go in the door. I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll do it. Can I push the button? But what Jesus is saying, no, the topnomapne, the spirit blows where it pleases. And I think in a lot of ways this is comforting and it's terrifying. It's comforting because it tells me that the spirit can take me places that I haven't yet built the capacity to imagine. But it's also terrifying because it shows that I don't get to just push the button. I don't get to control the mechanisms. It doesn't matter that I'm literally a teacher looking at you in this camera right now and, and, and you're seeing me, you're hearing me teach. But... You know, it's not up to me. It's not up to my control. It's not up to me to fully understand. And so I think in a lot of ways, the the sense in which Jesus needs to play the long game with Nicodemus, Jesus also needs to play the long game with me. And I think that's a little bit, at least, you know, for, for me personally, that's what it means to look at these characters as though Jesus is meeting them in the arena and to see, well, maybe Jesus is meeting us in our own arena. And when we turn the page, we're going to go to John chapter four. We're going to see the Samaritan woman. And she's someone who across the board has a more overall positive response to Jesus. There really aren't the reasons to be suspicious of her. Uh, that scholars and interpreters use to think that, okay, Nicodemus is an example of non-belief. Um, the Samaritan woman is portrayed more positively. But once again, I think we're going to find that Jesus meets her in the arena. So one of the things about the Samaritan woman that's really fascinating is um, that she is someone who shouldn't necessarily get it. We have this fascinating picture where going by all of the sort of socioeconomic or religious criteria, Nicodemus should have been first in line to understand what Jesus was all about. And the Samaritan woman is maybe one of the last people we would understand. And so if you remember maybe from teaching about the Good Samaritan, uh, Samaritans were, they were descendants of the northern tribes of Israel. And so they were not necessarily the people associated with the house of David and Solomon. They were maybe the people who uh, had a form of worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it wasn't centered on Jerusalem. And so for a lot of Jews, they thought, oh, they're just sort of doing this, you know, uh, counterfeit or inferior version of our religion. And yet it's the Samaritan woman who fully understands Jesus's message. And so returning to those sort of points of contrast between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman does a lot of things well. She enters the scene at the daytime, which I guess sort of signifies that she's lined up with the light of the world because she's showing up when it's light out. And when Jesus talks about this metaphor of living water, she just says, Sir, give me this water so that I won't go thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she's very receptive to the metaphor. Um, and we had already seen that um, in 
verse 11. And then she holds her own in conversation, whereas Nicodemus is saying less and less throughout chapter 3. In chapter 4, the conversation is pretty balanced between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus is not really as cryptic or ethereal as he is with Nicodemus. And then later on in the story, the Samaritan woman goes off to evangelize. And so she kind of becomes this example of a model disciple. But I want to argue that what's going on with the Samaritan woman, even though she is initially more responsive to Jesus, even though Jesus doesn't necessarily need to play the long game with her story the way he needs to do with Nicodemus, there's actually a lot in common between these two multidimensional characters. The first is that the discussion of living water and the discussion of being born again in chapters 3 and 4 are actually pretty similar. When Jesus tells Nicodemus you must be born again, Nicodemus is a little bit confused and he says something that maybe implies he's not fully understanding what a metaphorical register this has, but then what the Samaritan woman says might give you the same kind of implications. Uh, Jesus asks the woman for a drink and she says, uh, how can you ask me for a drink because Jews and Samaritans don't associate with each other? And Jesus answers, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And so the Samaritan woman replies, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And so sort of in the same way that Nicodemus is like, wait, how am I supposed to be born again? I can't just sort of return to my mother's womb. The Samaritan woman says to Jesus, how are you going to get living water that you, you don't have something to draw with? Like, how is this supposed to work? And so in a lot of ways, the conversation between Jesus and and the Samaritan woman is starting off in the same way that it did in the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. We have this metaphor and then this sort of semi-incredulous but also semi-curious response to it. And so as the conversation goes on, we don't have anything like we have in, in chapter 3 verses 11 and 12 where Jesus has to tell Nicodemus that you know he's failing to understand. We don't, we don't have this you just don't get it moment. But... Jesus does meet the Samaritan woman in her arena. So in verse 15, the Samaritan woman says, Sir, give me this water that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And so then in verses 16 through 19, Jesus sort of reveals that he is a prophet. He's a person with supernatural access to knowledge. He sort of gives a little bit of a sign. And it's one that meets this woman in the arena. He says to her, go call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus responds to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And that's the moment where she says, sir, I can see that you were a prophet. And so... What happens in that moment is Jesus is meeting this woman in her arena. And in her case, the arena might not be something like the difficulty and the challenge of being a scholar of religion, but then also being subject to God's spirit and moving however it pleases. Maybe for the Samaritan woman, the arena is the challenge of her past. A lot of interpreters might sort of cast the story as an example of, uh, you know, some kind of sexual impropriety or something like that. I don't know that that's necessarily more accurate. Um, a better reading might be something like this. Like, what if the Samaritan woman is having trouble with childbearing? And so she gets married, tries to have a kid. And she gets divorced by her husband because she's not able to carry out some kind of wifely duty. Uh, that, I think, is a really good explanation maybe of the sort of shame and stigma that she feels. And, you know, it's, it's possible that there might be some kind of sexual impropriety going on in, in her past. Um, but regardless, whatever, whatever that situation is where this woman has had several husbands, is with someone now who's not her husband. Um, that's a really, really difficult place. And what Jesus is doing in this moment is 
uh, Jesus is meeting her in her arena. Jesus is showing up and saying that he knows and is welcoming her in this place that is a place of her vulnerability. And maybe that's exactly what Jesus is doing with Nicodemus. And what happens with the rest of the woman's story is with Nicodemus, we had an example of Jesus playing the long game with someone. And I think with the Samaritan woman, we have an example of Jesus doing a lot of work with a person of ordinary faith. So in 429, we have this moment where the Samaritan woman, after Jesus' disciples sort of come back, uh, the Samaritan woman leaves her water jar, goes back to the town and tells the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And so the people come out of the town and make their way towards Jesus. And, you know, a lot of interpreters will say, hey, maybe the Samaritan woman isn't doing a very good job of understanding who Jesus is. Because she's not saying that this guy is the Messiah necessarily. She's not really being very committal on that. She isn't coming at this with some profound Christology. But then skip a few verses down to verse 39 and we see that it was having some kind of profound effect. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged Jesus to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of Jesus' words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. And so... I think what we're seeing with Nicodemus and with the Samaritan woman, with these encounters between Jesus and individuals, are these places where Jesus meets a people in their arenas and Jesus invites people into a very imperfect and a very ordinary and a very human kind of faith. Jesus meets Nicodemus in the arena of being a religion scholar and yet not having all of the answers. Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in her arena as a possible outcast with a checkered past. But in both of these cases, what happens is Jesus's incarnation, Jesus's descent from heaven comes, he comes down to humanity in the places where that humanity is the thickest in the places where our finitude and the places where limitation and those places of struggle, those arenas are most palatable. And I think the fact that Jesus meets these people who sort of come to this slow fledgling belief, I think there's a lot of beautiful grace in a story for that because, you know, it's very easy to interpret the gospel of John as you either believe or you don't. You're either light or you're darkness. But I think these actual conversations and encounters that Jesus has, these are places where the light is beginning to shine the darkness and push back the darkness. But it's doing so by showing up in the arena. And I think there's a couple of takeaways that we can have from these encounters between individuals that Jesus has where he meets them in their arenas. First, it shows us that a genuine encounter with Jesus is not going to be easy. Jesus doesn't meet these people and stay in their comfort zones. Jesus kind of beelines towards the arena, the place where ordinariness and hum their ordinariness and the humanity of their faith starts to emerge. And I think that could be a guideline for what a genuine encounter with Jesus is can look like for us. We all have stories with complication, with difficulty and struggle. And I think a way for us to see this is where Jesus is authentically meeting us is to look for those places where we're actually having some kind of vulnerability and seeing where Jesus is meeting us there. I think if we're really encountering Jesus, it's probably happening in the arena. And then there's a second thing, which I think is really comforting from this gospel. And this is something that we're going to talk a little bit about later when we talk about the history of the Johannine community. And that is that John, in his own way, is very clear that Jesus meets people in the arena. This is in John chapter 15, which is in the middle of the farewell discourse on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus tells his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. 
If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and that's why it hates you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. You know, we can go back to this concept, this, uh, this concept of the arena. We can go back to what Teddy Roosevelt had to say about it. The person who matters is the person who is with you in the arena, the person who is with you in the blood and the dirt and the sweat and the tears. And I think that's something that John does a really good job of being clear about, that Jesus, God incarnate, the God who was sitting on the lap of the Father and descended into humanity, even to the point of the cross, that is someone who meets us in the arena. Jesus may be a judge who issues a verdict, whose arrival is a form of crisis, but Jesus, even though Jesus gives the verdict, Jesus is not the critic who stands outside the arena, who issues judgment about where we could have or should have done better. The author of the fourth gospel does an excellent job in his own way of showing how Jesus is in the arena, acquainted thoroughly with victory over death and the defeat of betrayal and crucifixion. So that's something I want us to see in this gospel is that Jesus meets us in the arena. And next week, we're going to learn a little bit, not just about what it means to be individuals who encounter Jesus in the arena, but how Jesus works with a full community in the arena. We'll see you next week. Hey everyone, welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's. I'm Pastor Jeremy and I'm here with your other pastors, Melissa, Jen, and Jad. And we are continuing what has been an extremely fruitful study of the Gospels this week. We are looking at the third, fourth, and fifth uh, chapters of the book of John. And so we're just going to jump right in. So we get to concentrate on the Nicodemus story. So our lecturer talked about John in a bigger manner, but we get to concentrate on the Nicodemus story, which is really interesting in every gospel, but particularly I think in John. So let's talk about the fact, what do we think, you know, John does a lot with dark and light. You know, there's a lot of contrast we see in John. Why do you think it's important for John that Nicodemus came at night? Well, I do things in the nighttime if I'm scared. Now, I mean, that that sounded a little more uh, suggestive than I meant it, but, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think there's an element of fear of, of the safety of darkness, of, of cover, of when nobody else is around, when no one else is looking. Um, that gives us a little sort of uh, a, a hint at, at his motivations, at his um, mindset as, as, as to where he is mentally. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I think of the, the stepping into shadows. So I'm not seen. There's a little bit of this hedging his bets. Like I, I, I want to talk to Jesus, but I don't want to be seen talking to Jesus. So I'm going to talk to him, but make sure that everyone else can't see that I am because if he's not who I think he is, then I don't want to be seen around him. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's also that vulnerability of needing to learn, right? The, uh, not only the, I don't want to be seen talking to him if, if he's not who he is, but just how vulnerable is it as a religious leader to then go to Jesus and, and say, I don't know, and to look for knowledge. And uh, the covering of night can be that. I, I think about the fact that, you know, uh, we tell kids you need to go to sleep so you can get the sleep you need so you can grow, right? Uh, I think about mm -hmm. how nighttime can be nurturing in that way. Nighttime can be like, uh, can be like the nurturing of, of a womb or, you know what I'm saying? It's a space to grow. It's a space to rest and recuperate even still. Do you think that he goes for growth? Like, why do you think Nicodemus even goes to Jesus in this gospel? It seems like in other gospels, sometimes the questioning that happens, whether it's through Nicodemus's voice or others, it's, it's sometimes as a test and, and it feels like it's not as much for Nicodemus, but John's gospel, it feels like it, he's seeking something himself. What do you think it is? Mm -hmm. I, I see Nicodemus in that sort of you know, we talked, we talked a lot about this this year, but we, in that first moment of deconstruction, 
Um, that first moment where you're not sure it's safe to, to ask the first question, right? That's, that's, we hear from people who have gone on that, that journey, who have been in places where, um, you know, like Nicodemus was as a Pharisee, your job is to have the answers and the answers are, the answers are the answers. Um, whereas with, with Jesus and with, with Christianity, you know, um, with the way that we understand faith, the, the answers are not necessarily the, the point. Um, the journey is the point, the questions are the point, the relationship is the point. Um, but when you've come from a place where, where the answers are the point, the law is the point, the, the, that's the, the embodiment of it. That first question gets really scary. Um, so I, I see him on that first moment of, of dipping, beginning to dip his toe into deconstruction. That's, that's kind of where I, I picture him. I think also, um, what, so, so like what you're saying, Melissa, every good philosophy, Christianity, as well as being a faith tradition, and religion and all that it is a stream of philosophy and every good philosophy book every good stream of philosophy i know asks more questions than it than it offers answers because answers like that often are hollow and so when you think about uh coming from a perspective of law and the answers being the point that's not there's that's there's a there's a lack of live de- or there can be a lack of live depth especially when we see right. it, how the pharisees were living into that but i think that uh, when we look at what Nicodemus says to Jesus initially, it, it seems that he saw depth in Jesus's actions and Jesus's words. There was something there in what Jesus was doing that he wasn't seeing in his own tradition, that he wasn't seeing in his own community. And I think that we all kind of have moments like that where we hear somebody speak and they're speaking to a deep part of us. We see how somebody lives and they're living in a deep, uh, uh, in a deep place and we're drawn to that. And we want to know, what is the spirituality that you have? What is, what is this Jesus following? What is this life path that you have? Uh, uh, and I think that's what Nicodemus comes to Jesus looking for, because he's like, we know you're a you know you're a teacher sent from God. Nobody could see all you're doing and, and, and say anything else, you know? Yeah, because he doesn't really even begin with a question, right? He, he begins with a statement, right? And Jesus may have been a Pharisee uh, in training. And so he sees someone coming from his, the same embedded theology, the same embedded culture, the same framework of thinking, and but there's something different going on here, right? That um, that like, hey, this is this is a little different, and and so I think it's also interesting. The conversation begins with him making a statement and Jesus replying, and then Jesus reply, like you were saying, Jeremy, that that makes so much sense, and he draws it further and deeper, deeper in. Do you think he's looking for an either or or a both and? I don't know that he knows what he's looking for. Uh, that's fair, right? And we don't not, either. Yeah, it's and we and, and, and we can we can all kind of play with that. But I'm I'm not sure he has a clue what his end game is. I think that's part of the coming at night is he doesn't necessarily know what he is. That's why I say it's like it's that first like I don't even know where I'm going. I just feel drawn to take a step. Um, so I I I and, and I think that's why you we don't. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. It's kind of why we don't necessarily see what happens with Nicodemus. We don't necessarily see what he does as a result, because I don't think he's either satisfied or dissatisfied with with his encounter with Jesus. Right. I think it's just another piece of the the puzzle for him to to then wrestle with. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? That's so funny because we've talked about this because like you, you know, when you were doing a lot of the study for this particular. So, so for those of you, we kind of take turns on who's doing like the primary study as we put the sermon series together. And then we all do our own personal study. And when Melissa was doing the primary study on this sermon series, she was like, yeah, we don't really know. We, and I was always all the study I've done and the story and my own, it, it's my own, it's my own story in it is that no, he does follow, like he's there in the end, we see him. And so therefore it means he, he did take the both and he did. So it's so interesting because I think we read so much of ourselves. That's why I kind of asked the question, is it either or is it both and what's he doing? Because I think Nicodemus reads, everybody can read themselves into Nicodemus more so than some of the other characters in the gospel of John. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can all relate to them. And I think also like a lot of people who are encountering um, the people at St. Luke's 
I think definitely can, because he obviously is still coming from a literalist form, frame of like, I, I don't, do I crawl back into the wound? Like, how does that happen? Like, and Jesus trying to say, no, no, don't take this all literally. This is deeper. This is more profound. This is more, uh, there's more going on here. Um, and for those of y'all who want to follow along of where the, the two more times we see Nicodemus, um, we see him at the end of chapter seven, um, right. where he seems to come to Jesus defense in the midst of conflict between Jesus and religious authorities. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that he followed Jesus in between like that. That's the, like, you can, yes, you, can, he did. <laughs> you can take that and go, he's been a Jesus follower the whole time, but we don't necessarily know that we just know he came to Jesus defense. So this, this interaction definitely changed him somehow. Um, and he definitely had a, a connection with Jesus. And then we see him show up, um, at Jesus burial in chapter 19. Um, and, and it says Nicodemus's last appearance in the gospel is to help Joseph of, of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus with the burial of Jesus body. So do we also then assume Nicodemus? was a secret disciple of Jesus. Jen definitely does. Yeah. Um, and, secret. and, you know, I think, I think that question mark highlights what we talked about in the last series about what it means to make real the kingdom. I think it talks about in what we talk about in this series of, of finding love in incarnation, um, to ask that question of, can we show up at those high points Mm. Um, and not be a disciple in between or, or do those high points highlight what is, is in between with our discipleship? I, I think that's a fun, like discussion to have around, um, Nicodemus particularly, but like Jen said, that this is where we can see ourselves depending on how we want to, to think about that. Do we see this and go, oh, I only show up at the high points and need to do more. I, I need more story in between for myself or do we see these moments and go, this, this shows that Nicodemus did the work in between. And I, I think you can, can argue both ways. So yeah, that's the beauty of text, right? There's things at play. Yeah. And, and I wonder about when we think about scripture as text, right? And we think about, or, or as literature and we think about well, like, these are to a degree plot points, but right. for a person who is living a life of faith, um, I don't know if you can show up in those high points in that way if you haven't been living it out. I think about it like um, uh, I, I had uh, I, I knew a guy in ministry who his family was just naturally just very very strong physically, and so they could do these feats of strength. But sometimes when they tried to do something with uh, the, they, they could do these feats of strength without necessarily working out in between. But they would do these things and they would tear ligaments because their ligaments had not like right. uh, built up the strength to sustain what they were doing. And I worry that if we're not following a path of discipleship and being consistent, we'll try to show up and and and, and be strong pillars of faith. But we don't have the connective tissue to to really live into those things. Carry the weight. Yeah. yeah. Well, and well, and is that I mean, is that what churches nationwide are seeing? in terms of the pandemic, like, like we, we did show up on Sundays. We were not to call anybody out because there's grace for us all, Praise be. but, but we weren't doing the work in between. And so when Sundays weren't an option anymore, we didn't feel the need to show up on Sundays anymore, mm -hmm. you know, for ourselves, whether that's on campus or off campus, it doesn't matter. But I, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting because I think it's, it's easy to, to give up on one when it's taken away, when we haven't done the work in between. Yeah. What, what I find really interesting is that this passage, I, I don't think in our, in our Christian zeitgeist, we think of, of this passage as being where John 316 falls either. Mm -hmm. And no. I think I think right. that is a fascinating piece of this, that this is the story where Jesus speaks the words of John 3, 16, that we, most of us, many of us have memorized, um, but not in any context, just by themselves. Football. And Football the games. irony of, of that, that, that text being used and misused and used on its own in this story is, it, I just find it quite ironic. Tell me, why do you find it ironic? talk about why. um it it is it is an oversimplification of or it's a it's an it's a simplification of the gospel but 
taken by itself misses the breadth of the gospel. And it, it's often used as a weapon. It's often used as a simple answer. Um, it's often used pharisaically. If we're really honest, it's often used in that way um, to be like, well, you know, believe in Jesus so you can have eternal life. That's the, the be all and all of Christianity. That's the be all and all of following Jesus. And it's used in judgmental ways. When, if you read into verse 17, it specifically talks about Jesus coming, not for judgment. Um, and so, so it's, it's that proof texting that we talk about a lot of times where we take one piece of scripture and we just use it by itself and don't look at the context, but I'm curious what you all see, how, how does a, a phrase, a, a text like John three sixteen, and maybe how it has been used or how it is used or how you've seen it used, how does that change when you put it in, in the Nicodemus story? Yeah. Because it's such a simple statement. We say this is the simple statement of salvation and of faith. And yet it's in the context of someone asking questions and someone misunderstanding and someone needing more than the simplicity of a metaphor or a statement to better understand themselves. And so it seems, yeah, it seems reductive to kind of go, this is the only thing that matters because the context is this incredibly deep theological conversation that any of us could ask at any point, because sometimes we're asking it at the beginning of deconstruction, and sometimes we're asking it in the middle, and sometimes we're asking it, you know, in different places. Yeah. I just always think it's problematic when we isolate a text. One of the worst things we ever did to scripture was give it verses and chapters, because um, John three sixteen is powerful, but like we're talking about here, so is John 3, and gosh, so is John. And John was written as John. <laughs> like, so when we isolate a text, we can do anything we want with it. We can hurt people and harm people. We can put it on a t-shirt and make a million dollars and buy ourselves a yacht. Um, when that's where we're now, we're really removing it from everything else. Um, and we're moving it like what we're talking about here from this um, encounter that someone's vulnerable. Jeremy, you hit it enough to say, I know this goes against most things that I've been taught, but hey, you know, what you're doing, you're with God, aren't you? You know, and to be vulnerable to do that and to hear these words coming from our Lord and Savior to someone in that vulnerability, in somebody who is in a space of black and white, literally, this is how it is. It's literal. It's literal. And Jesus is going, ah, no, 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 no. It's bigger than literal, right? Yeah. You, you just miss, you miss it. The intimacy and the transformation that happens. Yeah, I, I think the thing that hits me most thinking about it this time around is that that leading up to John 3, 16, that whole conversation starts with Jesus saying, you're a teacher of the law and you don't know this. And then he, and then he goes to, to, to kind of explain God's compassion in a way. And that's, and that's how we get John 3, 3 16. He's like, uh yeah god so loved the word but yeah I, I don't know that hit me this time especially yeah um and, and i wonder how <laughs> I, I, yeah i don't want to ask a new question in the midst of that question but like how does that hit us as religious teachers it's like you're your teacher of the law and you and, and and you don't know this and it challenges me to keep that focal um to let things spring out of that you were about to say something jen no go ahead keep going with that thought this is it would be a tangent oh that's all i had be good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think it keeps us humble too, right? It keeps us humble. So, like, yeah. like we still need to be asking questions. We still need to be uh, hearing other people's perspectives and and the context that other people read scripture from, uh, mm -hmm. and the context that other people encounter God from, um, because we can begin to believe that that our context is is the end all, be all when when God works powerfully through so many others so yeah i think it keeps us humble too i would hope it does it it's the kind of thing that i i want to keep in mind you know when we do things like ask, ask the pastors sundays which we all love and and we enjoy and and the congregation enjoys but i think i said this um in in the service jad and i were in a few weeks ago when we did this um and i said we're going to give responses to your questions not answers to your questions right we are we are going to respond we're not going to pretend like we're, we're giving you a singular answer to anything this is this is just one more perspective um from us 
us. And just because we're religious leaders does not mean we have the answer, but we, we might have some responses that give you a little more context for you to do your work. So um, this is the perfect, perfect place to keep going back to, to, to stay in that, that headspace as much as we can. Mm. Well, and it's, it's so it, of, it, go ahead. No, I was, I was gonna say, it's like the end of the movie Dogma. Um, where Chris Rock, the, the apostle, and he says to, to this, the main, the heroine, right? She's the, the, in this, you know, like, so he asks her about like definite belief and she goes, no, but I think I have a good idea. Like there's yeah. just such humility there. There's so much openness for God to continue to move that, I don't know, it always makes me think of that. And, <laughs> and that's and a the follow, the follow up to that is that people kill each other over, over a, people kill each other over beliefs. Right. right. That, that's what that's what the, the character continues to say is, um, you know, I, ideas are, are less dangerous to to us with one another, that beliefs are 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 dangerous um, in some ways. So what was it that the bishop said The John Wesley quote he used at annual conference about opinions? Oh, my gosh. Uh, was it? Oh, my gosh. It's so good. I'll have to find it. Yeah, I'll, I'll look. Uh, it I'll look talking. <laughs> okay, it's really good because it goes into that. But what's interesting is, so we were paralleling this, of course, to, to the musical Oliver, and how does it become real? And the question is, where is faith? So, which is really interesting because Charles Dickens wrote this and Christmas Carol. It was a response to the church and to people of faith that we're not taking care of poor people and and we're letting. And we're actually using poor people, you know, in workhouses and things like that for their own prosperity. Um, and we have this um, Sunday, we're going to hear, you know, this version of the song that Fagin sings, who's the pickpocket master. <laughs> it's the best way I can describe him if you don't know the story. Who's like questioning his own life, like questioning what's, what's, do I, like I've lived this way and is this really the way I'm supposed to live? And he's, he's, what's it, what's the name of the song? Uh, reviewing, reviewing the situation, the situation. Mm -hmm. yeah and he's he's struggling with this this life that he's created and these children that he's created from I mean you know in the book he raised Nancy you know who we'll see as as part of one of the heroines in the in the story I mean they raised her to to live this life and what does he have to show for it and he's questioning it and it's interesting because I in, in some ways, we think this is a theological conversation that Nicodemus, Nicodemus is happening, but it, it's also his whole life. I mean, as a Pharisee, it would have been your whole life. It wouldn't have just been your one, like your job or just your spiritual life. It would have been everything about who you were, which if you're starting at the deconstruction point means deconstructing everything. And, and how often, and yeah, so like, those are the, those are the things I go to in the middle of the night. I mean, thank you about what you said about Dickens and writing uh, Oliver in response to the church not living into what the, what and who they're supposed to be. I think it kind of ties back into Nicodemus coming at night uh, when we consider like the latter part of that, or like I think it's like uh, 19 through 21 of that text, where it's like the light came into the world, but people of the darkness more in the light, the and, light. Uh, their actions were evil. So um, if the church is behaving like, Nicodemus and in the light in the daytime pretending to know what we're doing when we should in the light be uh sitting before the feet of Jesus questioning what does it mean to follow you what does it mean to serve your people right um right then our deeds will be evil if we if, if the only place we're living into the mystery of what it means to be people of faith and Christians is when nobody can see us right if if, if uh if we're if we're hiding that part of who we are um it's going to show up in how we how we treat other people Right, because yeah. because it's when the light comes in that the cockroaches shot scurry into the shadow. Right, which if you read the text of Oliver Twist, it it is it is it is so painful to read. It's it's mm -hmm. it's I I I just actually texted Steve McKinnon and was like, "There's no musical interludes when you read the book. Like there's no food, glorious food because it's breathe. just yeah. yeah, it's just it's painful and it's and." And he continues to, to he break the fourth wall in his writing and go, okay, now this is an interesting point for us to ponder. And, and, it, and, and it's about faith. And it's about like, wait a minute, the, it's the tension, it's the dark and the light. 
Um, and, and I think Nicodemus is calling us to hold the things in question. Like, should we just be coming at night with those things or should we bring those questions to the light? Because then it really exposes what, why we're asking the question in the first place. And what happens, and what happens when you, as a part of an institution that depends on people believing you got, you have it all, you know what I'm saying, together, what happens when you expose it as part of that organization, part of that uh, 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 institution expose that it's not all it seems, your life's mm -hmm. in danger, your life right. is in danger. Yep. Um, right. Had Nicodemus gone to Jesus in the daytime as a Pharisee, that probably would have cost him his life, or at least, or at least his livelihood. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, and that sounds like the, the cost of discipleship. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. Indeed. Where faith is lived is the bigger question. It's not where is my faith. It's where is your faith lived. Yes. And so there, for me, there's a lot of parallels then with what John Wesley was doing. Right. He was, hey, uh, the church isn't feeding people there are hungry children in these factories uh we need to feed them oh then i get an education we're going to give them education the church isn't doing that the church isn't taking care of their health so we're going to we're going to do that and all because of the gospel all because of the good news of jesus christ right so there's a lot of parallels there too um with that because he was kicked out of churches after church for preaching for proclaiming right. that word uh, bringing it to the light so personal holiness has to be lived out in social holiness Yep. Right. Like it just, it just, or, or what's, what's the point John Wesley would say. And I think that's what Charles Dickens was trying to, that's the social commentary of what he was writing in these books in Christmas Carol and David Copperfield and Oliver Twist is like, what's the point if you're not, if you're not doing this. And, and as some historians said, he was probably a person who lived in such kind of poverty and was, and so he was probably asking for himself. And, and giving voice to the poor and the impoverished and the forgotten and the marginalized because it was his voice. Yeah. Right. And was it Gary Pace that says the two wings of the bird? So yeah. personal and social illness, without one, you can't fly. You can't right. do what you were created to do. Sorry, Melissa. No, you're you're on it. And what what is crazy is as we have done the work of modernizing um, the musical, uh, it hasn't been that hard. <laughs> it has it has not been that hard to think where where do we see this in our modern day mm -hmm. um because because the the issues of poverty and the issues of hunger for children particularly um are just as prevalent now um, they have a different face on them they wear different clothes you know that was one of the things that our folks um who who consulted with us talked about is in in victorian times you could see where someone stood on the you know in the in the social chain based on what they were wearing now we all wear the same thing Thing. And so it, it's it's less visible even than it was then. And so Absolutely. to do something, it's it's why we're it's why we need to do this show. It's why we want to do the show in this way is is making visible something that is around all of us, literally everywhere we drive in Central Florida, everywhere we walk in Central Florida, everywhere we go. But it's invisible around us in some ways, um, mm -hmm. and we don't want to see. No. Right. And, and, yeah, even That's when it's visible, we look so we away. <laughs> and we don't have to think deal with that. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you know, he 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 comes at night and asks a question, what must I do? And and Jesus talks, as you said so beautifully, Jeremy, at the beginning, you, you have to be born again. You have to move move from the womb of darkness and security and safety into the light and into life which is hard and you got to live in that space and faith has got to come alive in that space not just not just in the dark space and and i think you know we we get pushed back when we sometimes when we go those places on in worship and things like that and 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 when we do reveal that we don't we're not we don't have it all together or we don't we aren't doing it right and and people get nervous about that and they like to go someplace safer. <laughs> um, but there's nothing, there's nothing just in this text again, because if you literally read the scripture, yeah. um, there's nothing in this text that is about safety. 
no. and hiding. Mm. I mean, if you think about if you think about the vulnerability of of uh, Nicodemus coming into the darkness, and then we hear in in the prologue to John that Jesus is the Word and the Light, right? And that the light comes back, like we said earlier. Uh, so I've come to you, and you're, there's light that's going to be shining. I'm going to be revealed. There's there's going to that's, that's that's uncomfortable. That's difficult. So here's um, here's a reading that you just like gave me, Jen. Of let's let's think about this as safety and and as as Jesus inviting Nicodemus to do something that's a little less safe, and then let's get to John three sixteen. So God sent His Son, yeah, to live among you. Like God did something that was very unsafe. We're about to yes. see just how unsafe it is. Yes. And if God can do it, why Ooh. do you think you shouldn't be asked to do yeah. it? Yeah. God Melissa. sent his only son. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking just as you were talking, Jen, I kind of got to the same place of, once again, thinking about Christianity as a philosophical model, like, it's the wrong one if you want certainty or if you want safety, because A, if we are called to be priests and prophets, all of us here, the cost of being a prophet seems to be throughout scripture, death. And then when you when you look at like the main, the, the center of the faith, Jesus, Jesus, he like he, he went to the cross. Like there's nothing, there's nothing safe about the ones we're called to follow and become like. And so safety and certainty, it feels like in Christianity are just not compatible. They're just, they're just, they're just opposing themes. Um, but, and, and, but when I think of the times I've been tempted to seek certainty in faith, it's come from a, a, an embedded theology where certainty meant safety from this weird otherworldly damnation. And I think that still exists in a lot of places and there's that, but there's also the, if I can go into a place where I'm being, where I'm being told all the things I need and want to hear, I feel better about who I am. And I don't feel like I have to make that move from darkness to light because I don't think there's anything wrong with Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. No. It's just, you have to make that movement from night to daytime, from night to light, right? It's, there's nothing wrong with sending thoughts and prayers. No, but now where's your action? Where it like where where did where is it leading to? You know, this is the perfect place for I, I I don't know if this was the quote that the bishop used, but I found a great John Wesley quote about exactly what we're talking about. It says orthodoxy or right opinion is at best a very slender part of religion, though right tempers cannot subsist without right opinions. Yet right opinions may subsist without right tempers. There may be a right opinion of God without either love or one right temper toward him. Mm. Satan is a proof of this. Mm. A W. So <laughs> if we want to talk about right belief. <laughs> right. You can right? Believe, and this is right. why I go, I don't know what Nicodemus did or not. I'm not sure because we only know two more moments he showed up and he did the right thing in those moments, but I don't know what he did in between. Mm. So. Mm. well and it, it 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 is interesting i love that you said jeremy the 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 it it the salvation part can you do you remember what you, how you said that i'm not sure which which part you're referring to you said something about the um idea that i i still worry about whether i'm right or wrong because i'm worried about that that damnation sure. salvation part, sure, right? Sure, sure. Just talking about like, the, there's a temptation towards certainty and faith. And if I connect these dots in A, B, and C, then I'm safe, right? And, and the fear of kind of having, uh, of leaning into the mystery of faith um, or what we don't know comes from wanting to stay safe from that idea of if I don't believe right and if I don't do right, there's this otherworldly hell waiting on me. Well, it's interesting because I just, as you said that, it's safety from this either or of salvation, but it's also safer for me to believe that's what faith is all about because another kind of faith requires something of me. It requires that I go through the, 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 the birthing process and get squeezed in the, in the birthing tunnel and, and leave it. it to believe that it's more than just that question 
means I have the, the, the world. I, I talked with a young person the other day and, and I said, you know, to live, live yourself, not believing in and having confidence in who you are means you you're letting go of the fact that you, you were created amazing ways uniquely because your purpose for something and they were like I don't believe everybody is created to make a difference and I was like oh you know that is fundamentally the gospel truth <laughs> like and but I think it's easy and I've sat with that all week and and realized I think that's the easier understanding of faith if it's just about my salvation and my personal it means I don't have the responsibility. I'm not created with the responsibility that I am. I was created to make a difference. I was created to fix the hunger problem. I was created to be a part of the homeless solution. I was created to be a part of the making sure that people are brought into the light yeah. and the problems are brought into the light. And that's 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 the harder. Where is faith? That's the harder part. That's the harder part. Yeah, but I mean, you know what? And even if you can't invest in the idea that we were each created to make a difference as individuals right then you have to, you, i think you still got to take responsibility for it and live into the fact that we yes we were created to do that and so you're a part of the tide you're a type of the tidal wave or supposed to be that that ends up making these changes we were talking about that a few weeks ago uh yeah. in, in in service about how um uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a cop out to say, oh, we're not all supposed to be Martin Luther King. Sure. But messianic movements aren't the ones that, you know what I'm saying? That like, you, you notice that less and less in justice movements today. It's less about picking one person and putting the movement on their back. And it's more about informing and empowering the people, right? And when you shrug that responsibility because you're not Martin Luther King, you, you, you're in the way of, you're in the way of progress. Not only, not, on, yeah, not only are you you know what I mean? Not not right. only are you denying the 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 sanctity in which you were created, you're in the way now. Right. Yeah, and it, progress. it and is that to go back to the to the scripture, is that what we see in Nicodemus? Is that in the beginning he was asking the question, how do I be born again? Or how do you know how do I have eternal life? Which was a question of salvation, right? Mm -hmm. But he shows up in the other places by doing the work of faith and by being present in the light and doing the work of justice and doing the work of compassion with the hands and feet. So, so it is interesting because he made that birthing process regardless, regardless of the other. He, he, he took part of the responsibility on. Look at that, we brought it all back together. Woo! <laughs> All right, so we are glad you've been with us. We hope you've enjoyed, we've enjoyed having a conversation. Whether you all enjoy it or not, I hope you do because we have a lot of fun when it's us. Um, we are excited because Sunday, we are going to have founding pastor of St. Luke's, uh, Jim Harnish is actually going to be preaching. So we'll be pre preaching for both services, all the services, and he's going to punctuate this. And we asked him to come. We're going to have some guest preachers along the way. We asked him to come because he's really been interested in what we're doing with Oliver. And uh, so we're excited to have him come. And so we hope you'll be here on Sunday or you'll watch virtually and be worshiping with us. And until next week, prepare yourself for worship by reading John chapter three through five and have a blessed week.